morning. Uh, I'm Ray Lowe, and welcome to Breaking the Rules. And I'm going to be your host for the day, along with Casey Dempster. And Casey, uh, happy Tuesday. Thank you. So you're going to tell us about why our show is called Breaking the Rules. Okay. We're doing this different I, this I time because we're Ray breaking the rules. Breaking the rules. <laughs> Um, our show is called Breaking the Rules because it's about change, and change is something that whether we like it or not, we can't avoid. And a lot of people really are uncomfortable and resist change. And it might be because the rules surrounding that change might not fit who they are. So what we're saying is just because things have always been done a certain way doesn't mean that you always have to do them that way. And um, I have an interesting quote, as usual, from a very um, wise man, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, the United States Constitution has proved itself the most marvelously elastic compilation of rules for government ever written. Well, we try and break those all the time, don't we? Well, apparently yeah. so does the government. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I also consider myself the luckiest guy in the world. And let's talk about that for a minute because the luckiest guy in the world is not a job title I have. It's not a contest I won. What it is, is it's a state of being. It's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great place to be because when you feel this way, you wake up every morning and you're excited about the day. And at the end of the day, I can usually look back and say, wow, what a great day. I, I really did some good things for some good people. And probably most important is the feedback you get from those people around you. So the whole concept of our whole Luckiest Guy program is to get everybody to feel like they're the luckiest person in the world too. And you do that by planning where you want to go. Because as you always say, if you don't know where you're, you want to go, how are you going to get there? Yeah, and Yogi Berra has a few quotes and a few other yeah. things in here too. But, but you know, this, our, our speaker later today is going to talk about uh, planning mm -hmm. and, and how it's the plan that drives the money, not the money that drives the plan. And, and the reason that he's successful with his clients is because he does planning from the state of view of his clients. And we think this is one of the most important things for you to do too, if you want to ever feel like the luckiest person in the world, uh, you have to start with that plan. Right, and one of the most important things that a lot of people don't understand is this story that you told last week about the retirement hyenas. Okay, well we're gonna get into that too with Marty in a little bit, because um, when Sandy, my wife and I were in Africa. Uh, we took a plane from place to place. And I remember our first stop uh, as we flew in and stopped. I'm looking around at this magnificent scenery. And the next thing I did is I looked back at the airplane and they're wrapping huge spools of barbed wire around the plane. And they're attaching this wire to big batteries. And I'm sitting there saying, what's going on here, okay? <laughs> and, and one of the things that they told me is that if if the, they don't do this, the hyenas will come in tonight and eat the tires. <laughs> and, and this is part of uh, the planning process that you have. You've got to know where you're going, and then you've got to put things in place to protect yourself. Correct. And you always have to do this. Mm -hmm. Let me finish up with this planning idea a little bit because uh, uh, I think it's so important, and we actually set up a process on our website that you, our audience, can go and plan, and this is absolutely free. And when you get into the whole concept of planning the rest of your life, it's complicated, isn't it? And overwhelming. Yeah, so, here, so most people don't plan. What they do is they kind of go from stage to stage to stage. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the way to do this is not to sit down and try and create this overwhelming plan where everything is perfect. So we recommend that people start planning by planning in 90-day segments. So it's kind of like planning your life in 90-day segments. And the beauty of this is you sit down and you make your plan, you create it, and at the end of 90 days, if you don't like where you're going, you can make some changes. But the whole idea is eventually you have to have this plan in place because otherwise you don't know where you're going. You don't know how to spend your money, you don't know how to plan things, and uh, 
You know, I told this story before, I'm going to tell it again. Uh, not too long ago, I was in Birmingham, Alabama. I was at the World Senior Games. I'm a swimmer. I did my swimming thing, and as I nosed around, I saw this uh, young gentleman, okay, with six medals. He's carrying them around. Five of them are gold. One of them is silver. And I went up and talked to him, and I found out later that John, his name, was competing in the 100 to 104 age group. Mm. And the events that he won at age 103 were the shot put, the discus, the hammer throw, things you'd never expect a 100 centenarian would do, right? Uh, and yet he lost one event, okay? So there's more than one person in this age group. And what we're seeing now is a strong migration of people into the centenarian group. And if this is you, what's your plan going to be? Right. Okay. Right. And I think, you know, like just to get back to the 90 day idea, um, I think people need to have a general idea of where they want to be throughout their life, but to, to plan the specifics about how they're going to get there in 90 day segments. Isn't that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. And I think when our guest comes on, in a minute we're going to have Marty Higgins come on and he's a, uh, a wonderful financial advisor. But the strength of what he does is he is really an outstanding planner. And uh, he's going to tell us it's not about the money, it's about the plan. And the plan drives the money, not the other way around. Right. right. So we're going to take our break a couple seconds early here because I want to give Marty a little bit more time. He's got exciting things to say to us. And after our break, we're going to introduce Marty Higgins, certified financial planner, and he's going to tell us how he's put together this system that helps people get ahead in life. Excellent. When did you see the sign? When I needed to jumpstart sales. Build attendance for an event. Help people find their way. Fast Signs designed new directional signage. And got them back on track. Get started at fastsigns.com. Hi, I'm Sylvia, the wine entrepreneur hosted a brand new show called Cooked and Uncorked on RVN TV. Every week at noon on Wednesday, we're gonna introduce a brand new wine or spirit with a different chef and their cuisine. It's gonna be an exciting way to, to learn how to pair your food, to uh, sip wine from around the world, and to have a good time. Be there or you might miss your next great wine or your next great meal. Got a quarter? When did you see the sign? when I needed to jumpstart sales. Build attendance for an event. Help people find their way. Fast Signs designed new directional signage. And got them back on track. Get started at fastsigns.com. Hi, I'm Sil. Welcome back to Breaking the Rules. I'm your host, Ray Lowe, and with me today is Marty Higgins. And I've known Marty for a long time. Welcome to our show, Marty. Thank you. Glad uh, to be here. Marty's the author of a book, Distribution Land. We're going to find out a lot more about this later. But uh, let's talk a little bit about you. Sure. All right. So uh, you're married, right? Yes. 38 years next month. To the same woman. To the same, same woman. woman. First, right? <laughs> one so, and only. So you're a rare breed to start with, right? <laughs> Seems that way. Okay. And you have children? Three. And grandchildren? Three. And you have a company called? Family Wealth Management. And the family, uh, part of that was put in how many years ago? Probably almost two decades ago, but it was for, I named it after multi-generational planning for my clients and their families. And, and now? No happening? idea that my young children at that time would come to work with me. In fact, none of them wanted to um, <laughs> until one, at one point my daughter, um, uh, she, she wanted to come work for me and I, I said they have to go do something else first before they come. And then they, uh, my wife and her strong-armed me, and, and I had to hire her. And it was the best thing I ever did because <laughs> she runs the show now. Okay. And, then, and then my youngest son came on as an advisor 
uh, he, he was doing some other things, and he decided that rather than try and um, push this square wheel and try and make it round, he'd jump in the car going 80 miles an hour and come join me. Well, and isn't it amazing how all that came together, too? Yeah, I never foresaw it. Well, I think there was some planning in yeah. there. You probably <laughs> set the stick, and your kids didn't have a chance, right? right, right. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your practice and how you run it, because you do what I think are some unique things. And uh, we're going to talk about your book later on, and it's a unique process that you developed. But one of the things that I think is really unique that you do is the depth of planning that you do. And when you set up your practice, you were telling me earlier that you actually went out and interviewed people. And I don't know too many people who do that. So tell us a little bit about why and when and what and go from there. Yeah. I realized that um, uh, everything was all about the money and retirement planning. And there was a lot more, there was a lot of risk involved in that. So I, my philosophy was the money should be the servant to a plan. Otherwise, it wanders around aimlessly changing, chasing benchmarks like the S&P 500, which have mean nothing to a person's real life. Um, so I went out and interviewed 30 family units, whether it be a couple, individual, widowed, widow or whatever, and um, took about an hour or so. And we did it at a restaurant after hours at a tape recorder back then <laughs> that was bigger than it should be. And um, had a, what I would call guided discovery. I had a series of questions that I would ask them. And we would go down that path a little bit. And then when I had enough information, we'd go down again. And I got a lot of unique stories from people as far as um, what, what their frustrations were, what they liked about their, their financial situation, experiences that happened to them. Um, their, if they had a financial advisor, what the relationship with, with that person was, uh, good, or, good or bad. And how could they, if they could, how could they design for me the perfect advisory relationship? and products, and what did they like, um, some stuff, leave me alone with that stuff, enough of that, mm -hmm. you know, stuff being pushed at them. And from that, I developed this process, a six-step process, which the first step in it is, um, is just uh, all, all, all about them. It's, uh, we record, uh, I, I interview them, and get to know them. It's people before numbers. Mm -hmm. So unless I know about the people and what the real money means to them, what it's supposed to do, how can I design a plan? If the first thing that, if, if, if you're interviewing a financial advisor and the first thing they wanna see is your statement, you should probably run for the door, okay? They don't know anything about the people. So we wanna know the people first. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the things, again, we were talking about this before, so you, you prepped me well. <laughs> but but uh, you were talking a little bit about the fact that uh, so many people accumulate money for the sake of accumulating money. They, they feel this need to do that. And then they're reluctant to spend it. Mm -hmm. So give us some words of wisdom about this. Well, know? I think it's because they don't know. There's, you know. I've seen both ends of the spectrum. People who won't spend it because they're fear of running out of money. Two observations from my book from meeting with people for over four decades is number one, people grossly underestimate their life expectancy. They think they're, gonna, they're not going to live as long as they, as they actually will. And I think that's to justify their spending, quite frankly. <laughs> okay. Number two is they can't get their head around inflation. So they don't really know, know how much money they're going to need 25 years from now. They just think, if I have 100 grand a year, I'll be fine. Well, for a couple of years, you will be. After that, you're going to be. And they don't know the other risks that are out there, whether it be um, not only inflation, I just mentioned health care um, and, and all different market risks that can be, uh, can be addressed. OK. Now, you mentioned another story. Uh, you were on a plane once coming back from a meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you know which one. So. Go ahead and tell yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this was good because it shows the value of planning. I mean, it hits you over the head. So I'm coming back from San Diego at a, uh, from a conference, Million Dollar Roundtable, and um, I find out that one of my planning clients, he had passed away suddenly. So I called my wife and said, I won't be coming home right from the airport. I'm going to the viewing first, and then I'll be home. So I go to the reception line. Now, I had known the son. I know the wife and the son. And I had never met the three daughters. They were in different parts of the country. So they flew in, and um, the, uh, my client introduces me to her daughters. And the one daughter says immediately, she says, you know, Mom, she goes, you're not supposed to make any important decisions for about six months to a year. She goes, oh, no, honey. Daddy and I have been working with Marty for seven years. I know exactly what I'm doing. Now, wouldn't, shouldn't that be the feeling of a widow grieving for her husband right. versus wondering if there's any, going to be enough money or income? 
There's a plan. There's a plan. Place. There's yeah. a plan in place. That's important. You know, uh, people don't spend money because they're afraid they're going to run out. Uh, but I think you told me another story about the uh, richest person in a grave or something like yeah, that. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm talking to this one woman, and she's got plenty of money, but she's afraid to spend it. You know, the, the depression mentality, so mm -hmm. to speak. And, it, it, you know, once they know how much they can spend, they might be more willing to do it. But she's struggling with that. So I said, you know, and we'll call her Mary. I said, you know, Mary, there's no prize for being the richest woman in the cemetery. I said, <laughs> we, you have a choice. You can enjoy this money now with your children and grandchildren. See the smile on your grandchildren's faces, or they can get it at a reading of the will. Your choice. Right. She started crying, and now, and, yeah. and now we're, we're making, you know, spending money every year yeah. to say, take them on one or two yeah. trips. That story could be my mother, whose name was Mary, <laughs> but she was a depression child, and um, she was left quite comfortably by my father when he passed at 65. So she had um, over 30, almost 30 years where she was living on her own. And um, she, she, was, she fits that profile. She mm -hmm. was afraid to, not so much afraid, it was just that she grew up being frugal and she didn't know how not to be. Right. So she needed, she needed like one time she was fussing over something that was gonna cost her $100. And I said, mom, what are you saving it for? Yeah. And that, you know, kind of hit home for her. Yeah. Well, there's, there's also, there's, um, uh, in my book, I have the tale of two doctors. Mm. And um, would that be appropriate now? Sure. Or? Okay. Yeah. So, and all these are true, by the way. I, these are all experiences, and I just name them. And uh, so, I'm, so this one doctor comes in and his wife, and um, he wants me to, to, to talk about investments and mm -hmm. preparing for retirement and such. I said, well, we need to start that with some planning, cash flow. We need to see initially exactly what you're... Um, what that looks like, and um, but he was he had everything in the bank. He mm -hmm. would not. He was on CDs. This was the uh, late '90s, so he's everything in CDs. And um, uh, I, I run the analysis. I tell him to bring his wife in, and uh, and I'm showing him that by like '85 he's out of money, and based on his saving, his spending, and such. And he says, "Yeah, but it's safe. It's safe. It's safe." Finally, I said, "Doc." Let me put it a different way. You're going broke. You're doing it safely if it makes you feel better, <laughs> but you're going to go broke, okay? So fast, and, and the reason the story is pertinent because later the same week, I see another doctor, and he's got about 10 times what the first doctor has. So, and about the same spending requirements, same time frame, going to retire. But he's not investing in CDs. He's investing at that time in technology. He's got a buddy on the West Coast doing day trading who's another doctor, stopped practicing medicine. And I said, Doc, do you think you have enough money to live comfortably forever? He says, yeah. I said, then why are you trying to turn, say, $5 million into $25 Because if you mess it up, you're going to be working forever. So I did do things with him. Never did anything for the first doctor. The funny part was he calls me up about three years ago. And he says, do you remember me? And I'm like, yeah, actually, I talk about you all the time. <laughs> I didn't tell him that. But um, so he says, well, did you change your mind? About what? About how I should be investing. I said, you're not broke yet? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I didn't change my mind. I've, you need to be doing certain things differently. He said, I, I said, you'll find somebody. Keep calling. Somebody will work with you. And, You've yeah. got such great stories. And I'm going to have to stop us here because we have to go to a break. Sure. But um, if everybody will wait a few minutes, we'll be back with some more great stories. Thank you. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest.
Welcome back to Breaking the Rules. Our guest, Marty Higgins, our co-host, Casey Dempster over here. And Marty, you were into really good stories, but I want to interrupt you a minute because we have this book that you wrote, Distribution Land. And if I read you correctly, this book is really your unique process. It's how you do things. And if somebody reads your book, they're going to have a feeling of how you do things. And yes. your book's available where? It's on Amazon. Okay. Or we have a site called uh, distributionland.com. Okay. I have a little book trailer up there. It's about three minutes. You can watch that and then uh, purchase the book right there through Amazon. Okay. And, and just quickly, distribution land, um, it, that's more with how people are going to, it's not the accumulation phase. They're, they've got their pile of money and this is telling them how to. Right. The, yeah, the whole financial industry is based on building that pile. Mm -hmm. There's very little experience in going down the other side of the mountain. So to, to, there's a story, and, and by the way, it's a book of stories. It's written to the average person, not to my peers to understand. Right. It's not, it's not, not it's low. very, no, it's not high, it's very low. It's stories. So the, to, the, per, the, the purpose of the book Distribution Land, it's, uh, I give an analogy of Mount Everest. Uh, about 17% uh, of the deaths happen on the ascent up Everest. About 83% of the tragic deaths happen on the way down. Wow. So there's much more risk when you're taking money out of that pile over a long period of time. It used to be, you know, our grandparents, they worked till 65, they're dead by 72. You couldn't mess it up, right? right. Now, the people are retiring earlier, living into their 90s. And if you think about it, if somebody retires at 60, 65, they could be living off this money longer than it took them to get it. So that's different now. And there has to be somebody who's, who's guided somebody down that mountain before. You don't want to go down f for the first time with the guide for the yeah. first time. You know, there's something I want you to get in. I know we want to get the stories in, but you were talking a little bit about the dangers in the bond market right now because it's going to be an entirely different story than everybody's been used to. Take a yeah. minute or two and comment on that. Yeah, it used to be that a risk-averse individual could hide in bonds um, and get 6, 8, 10, 12 percent from the 80s on to several years ago. That's, that's different now. That's going to change. So, you know, from the 50s to the, to the 80s, it, it, was, it was more struggling. I mean, in 1981, I could give you a money market account with a checkbook for 21% interest. I remember those. Okay, days. I mean, that's, that's now, now, CDs were 16. People forget inflation was 17, okay? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but um, so the best way that I can convey that to people to, to let them understand it is let's, it, it's, it's not what you don't know that can hurt you, it's what you know to be absolutely true, which isn't. So imagine we're farmers, right? Okay, so we walk out of our, uh, of our door in the morning to look in the barnyard, and the dogs are barking, the pigs are oinking, the cows are mooing, and the horses are yaying, right? The next day we come out, and the pigs are oinking, the dogs are oinking, the cows are oinking, the horses are you know, what the heck's going on here? Everything's different. Yeah. That's where we're going. And, and most of, you know, unless you've been through these things before, are there, how many advisors are out there that have been through you know, prior to 1980. I mean, I started in 76, there wasn't much experience there, but we study this stuff, we know, and it's, it's, you can't hide in bonds like that anymore and really get those type of returns. It's much more challenging for somebody. So to, you need that plan, but you also have to realize the plan's gonna change, the environment's gonna change, and you have to be prepared for that. Yeah, and there's different insurance products now that have been created that, that, that are risk averse. Insurance is risk averse in its, it, in, in its nature. They may be suitable as well. Sure, enough of this technical stuff. Correct. Velociraptors. Okay. So I'm meeting with a uh, client of mine, his CPA. He comes in one morning, and um, we're going through the cash flow analysis, his planning. He paid for a plan. Mm -hmm. And um, we're looking at it, and like the other doctors, he's running out of money in his mid 80s. He's primary, he's afraid of the market at the time mostly on the bank, right? And based on his spending, he's running out of money. He's not getting it, really. he's not understanding it, but he's a CPA, he's not understanding. He said, I don't understand. I said, and I had been watching Jurassic Park that week, reruns, for some reason. And like I said, stuff just comes to me. So I make up the story, I said, have you ever seen Jurassic Park? He says, yeah. I said, well, there's a scene in, a scene in Jurassic Park where this young boy comes up to the archeologist, I forget his name, and he says, I'm not afraid of the raptors. I, I, I'm not afraid. And, the archaeologist looks at him and he says, son, he said, the velociraptor will be about six foot in front of you, okay? And there'll be a, probably a puddle in your shoes as he scares the, the bejesus out of you, right? But don't worry about him. 
You don't have to worry about him at all. The velociraptors hunt in packs. The two on the sides are going to get you, and you're never going to see him coming. He looks at me like, what the heck are you talking about? I said, you're staring down market risk. You think you've got it all under control. The two on the sides that are going to get you, inflation and longevity, you're never going to see them coming. And before you know it, it's too late, and that's what's going on here. He says, I get it. What do we have to do? Cool. Yeah. yeah. So that, that stuff works. It's a great illustration. Yeah. Puzzles? Yeah, see, I start my first meeting with a prospect, and I ask him, let's say there's a 2,000-piece jigsaw puzzle here on the table in front of us. Where would you start? Where would you start? I try to find the corners and right. the edges. Ninety-nine percent of the people say on the corners of the edges, and I say, I say that's not where I would start. I submit to you where I would start is the picture on the cover of the box. First, I need to know what this is. Money is about to you. Who are you, and wh what does this money mean to you guys? Then we can start putting the pieces together. The problem is, you go into another advisor's office. All they're doing is moving pieces around all the time. Well, they're going to change these mutual funds, these stocks, over to our mutual funds and our stocks. And all you're doing is moving the pieces around. No real plan, nothing changed, just moving the pieces around. So we need to start with the picture on the cover of the box. See, where I start is I steal a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And then let everybody else yeah. worry about the puzzle. Yeah, you're that guy. <laughs> That's good. Yes, he is that guy. <laughs> okay, uh, one of the things that we should do, this is just because we have to do this, is you are with a broker dealer. We have to put up this disclosure thing. So uh, if you can do that for a second, okay, and then we have more stories? I'm sure. Okay. Uh, you got any that you can think of offhand, or do we have to fill in for some time here? Okay. No, let's say um, we have, uh, what would have come to me? Well, we had, we had uh, the, the Jurassic Park, we had the Mount Everest, we had the puzzles. Okay, what, what um, how do you start your plan? You know, when, when you get people involved in things and you have that initial meeting, uh, one of the things that I found is that uh, too many times your plan is imposed on you by others. Mm -hmm. So how do you circumvent this? What do you do? Understanding people before numbers. And what, what do they want to have happen? My, job, my highest value is to, is to make sure that what you want to do can happen. If it can't, wouldn't you want me to tell you about it? Because we need to address it. Would it be fair to let you retire at 62 if you're going to run out of money by 82. You know, that, that wouldn't be fair. If, you, if things need to be changed, you should understand it right now. Now, how do you want to spend that money, though? What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. What does retirement look like? Mm -hmm. Most people don't know. They just going to retire. Right. Yeah. And do what? Right. <laughs> yeah. You, oftentimes, we had clients that we would show them all the projections and everything that they were going to have plenty of money, and they didn't believe it. How do you deal with that? Like, they, to them, that wasn't real. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a client that's it, it, got um, a lot of money mm -hmm. and spends it like he has none, right? <laughs> yeah. It's that depression attitude sometimes. I mean, they, so, so and, and, you know, some you can't, you can't help, mm -hmm. and, you know, to that degree. But there's others that makes you feel good, like the woman I mentioned earlier about the richest woman in the cemetery, yeah. where you can get through to them. And the objective, and sometimes it takes time right. to get through them to let them feel comfortable that they can spend so, this money. Unfortunately, our time's about up. So let's get your book, Distribution Land, up here. This is a storybook. It's about how to use your money to a large extent. It's about your unique process. We've been talking to Marty Higgins, CFP. Uh, Marty's been in this business for a long, long time. He's got a family business, and he does wonderful things for people. So, Marty, Thank you. thanks for being with us. My pleasure. And, uh, Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.